Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Gnosis is the root wisdom of all the world's great religions. Gnosis is a universal teaching of practical science, whose goal is absolute liberation from suffering and the complete development of the human being. This lecture is one of many, available by free download or podcast. The hundreds of hours of lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an online chat, allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. To learn how to participate or tune into our continuous web broadcast, visit our website for more information at GnosticRadio.org. Gnostic Radio is made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. For more information or to make a donation, visit our website at GnosticRadio.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. tree of knowledge, the knowledge that we seek to understand, is symbolized in the book of Genesis as a tree in the garden that Adam and Eve are forbidden to eat from. We know the story that, of course, Adam and Eve make the mistake of being tempted by the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And from that moment began suffering. All of the suffering that we have, the suffering of death, of age, of illness, of pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, began with that mistake, if we look at it historically. But we know that every symbol in the Bible and in all the great scriptures holds more than one meaning. And of course, in this tradition, we try to go deeper than the literal meaning and penetrate into the other levels that are hidden that are not readily visible to those who are not specially educated or initiated. We discussed last, in the last lecture, the meanings of the Hebrew letters related to how the tree of knowledge of good and evil is presented in Bereshit, or Genesis, where the book says, Da'at tov vera which means knowledge of good and bad, or knowledge of good and evil. Those of us who have some background in, in a Jewish or Christian religion are well familiar with this story of the man and woman in the primeval garden who, it is said, were there in complete innocence, in complete happiness, without any manner of suffering, and without death. And it seems a fairly common understanding, something that you could pretty much assume, that if you have a story about a naked man and a naked woman in a beautiful garden, 
that somehow sex must be part of the picture. There must be a sexual aspect. Yet unfortunately, modern religions, in fact for many centuries, have failed to explain the sexual mysticism or the sexual symbolism hidden in this ancient story. And this is much to the detriment of this world. Because in fact, an in-depth understanding of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is precisely the doorway out of suffering. It is the doorway back to Eden. And we know this is true because the first letter of Da'at, or knowledge, is Da'let which symbolizes in the Hebrew language, a door. This is the doorway back to Eden. It is through knowledge, through da'at, or gnosis, that the fallen humanity can return back to a state of happiness, a state of ecstasy, or bliss, which in Hebrew is Eden. The word Eden literally means bliss or pleasure. And this again points out to us that the Garden of Eden and the story of the Tree of Knowledge must have something to do with sex. The very name Eden means pleasure. It means bliss. When we look deeper into the letters in this word da'at, as we did in the last lecture. You'll recall that the second letter is Ayin, which as a symbol on its own means to know, to experience, to see, to perceive. So it has two yods at the top of its shape, which can represent the eyes Not necessarily the physical eyes, but that manner in which we perceive and gain experience or knowledge. But as we discussed in the last lecture, Ayin has a, has a duality. It has potential outcomes that are polarity. But it's also represented in its structure of two parts. Da'at, this doorway of knowledge, can lead to good or evil, tob or ra. And ayin symbolizes that. This is why in the ancient Kabbalah we know that ayin is either the pathway to iniquity or to modesty or chastity. And these two words in Hebrew start with ayin. These words are avon and avan, anava. Avon means iniquity. Anava means modesty or chastity. So here in the ayin, we see the two paths also, which are sexual. Iniquity being the path of fornication, the path of death, the path of ra. Modesty or chastity being the path of Tob, the path of goodness. Gedula and Geburah. These are the two sides of Da'at, contained in its very middle, in its heart. And the third letter is Tav, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the 22nd letter, which encodes the entire tradition all the mysticism of Kabbalah is within the Tav. It's the seal, the covenant, the stamp that wraps everything together. And this is why this word, this letter, Tav rather, in Kabbalah is said to have also its duality. Its positive aspect is Emet, which means truth. And Emet ends in the letter Tav. But its negative aspect is death, which is mavet, 
So we see here again how the Kabbalah presents to us the two paths of thought in its very letters, but also in Tob and Ra. So if we take these elements and we meditate upon them, we can easily come to the realization that there are two paths available to us through sex. If Da'at, knowledge, is sexual in nature, then there are two ways to use it, Tob and Ra. We have further evidence that knowledge or to know is sexual by the use of the word knowledge in the Bible. There are many cases where we find, for example, and Adam knew his wife, and she begat Cain. Or when Mary said to the angel, how can this be that I should have a child when I have not known any man? Many cases like this. So knowledge implies a sexual knowledge. We do not study this just for the sake of theory or because it's interesting. We study this because we're tired of suffering. We study this because we want a fundamental change in our experience of life. We want a fundamental change in our experience of death. We want to know. We want knowledge. Da'at. Therefore, this knowledge of Da'at is very practical. And when applied in our daily life, can render great change if we use it wisely. But we need to understand the difference between Tob and Ra. We need to understand the symbolism of Adam and Eve in this book, in this great Kabbalistic symbol. As I mentioned, every symbol has multiple levels of meaning. And thus, Adam and Eve have a literal meaning related to an ancient humanity who made a mistake. Adam and Eve also have a physical meaning related to our own body, our own physical body and its energetic counterpoint, counterpart. In this context, Adam represents the brain. And Adam, our own brain, our own mind, is tempted by our own Eve, which is the sexual organs. Our mind is tempted because it likes pleasure, and it is tempted by that fruit of sex. Through Eve, the sexual organs, who in turn is tempted by the serpent, Lucifer, which is a symbol of our own inner tempter, our own inner Satan. But Adam and Eve also represent husband and wife. That through the cooperation of a man and a woman, the return to Eden can occur. But for that, we have to know the laws of Eden and how to come back into harmony with those laws so that we can return to Eden. So Tob and Ra become of critical importance to us at this point. Tob means good or goodness. This is the path of good. To be in harmony with the laws of Eden is to follow Tob. And as we discussed, these three letters, Pet, Bab, and Bet, contain that knowledge. And, and Tav, or um, Tob, good, goodness, relates to our own inner spirit, chesed, love, or goodness. This chesed is our inner being, our inner spirit. But unfortunately, we have been under the illusion of the serpent and have fallen into the path of Ra. And as we discussed in the last lecture, Ra does not mean evil in the sense of a great villain, like from the movies. It means the impure spirit, pollution, 
psychological pollution, spiritual pollution. And you see that it is made of the two letters, resh and ayin. This is the negative ayin, which I told you relates to iniquity and death, as the two letters in Bath point out. Ra in Kabbalah is defined as pollution. And this is specifically sexual. It's specifically when sexual crimes are committed in the temple of, of God, which is our own selves. And this is why in the book of Corinthians, we see that it is written, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor a person who commits extortion will inherit the kingdom of God. All of these are egos, desires, People tend to read this passage literally as if it's being uh, an indication towards particular people. What we fail to realize is that all of us have Ra within that impure spirit. And all of us have these different desires or latent tendencies in our own mind. Every one of us has the elements of adultery in our own mind. Because all of us have broken that commandment that Jesus explained beautifully in the gospel. That even if you look at a woman with lust, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. It's explicitly clear that this is a form of adultery. And all of us are guilty of that. So we cannot claim that other people are adulterers. Because we are. That is in our mind. And the same is true of fornication <clears throat> and idolatry. To be an idolater is to worship anything other than God. We don't really worship God. We worship our own pride. We worship our own sense or need for security. We worship our personality. We worship money. We worship our fear. We enthrone our memories, our resentments, we have many elements in our own mind that we, idol Id we idolize, we worship. And these are all because of the influence of Ra, the impure spirit, that is our own egotistical psyche. What's curious about the knowledge of Da'at and, and this specific um, hidden part of the teaching is, as I mentioned, so many religions fail to address why Da'at or this tree of knowledge is sexual. And there are so many contradictions in religions and in the teachings of uh, our modern and our theories that we have about religion now. What this teaching tells us when we look into its depth is that in the beginning God placed a man and a woman side by side in Eden in blissfulness and it's only because of falling under temptation that the man and the woman were ejected from Eden were cast out and that's when death and suffering began what this tells us is there is a secret knowledge that occurs or that is available between man and woman. It's this knowledge of Da'at. And it's very strange that so many religions now reject the union of man and woman. And for centuries have said that a person needs to be alone to be a so-called celibate. Which is nowhere demonstrated in the Bible or in any religion except when Paul was explaining some very subtle things, which are greatly misunderstood, about 
being a eunuch, and Jesus spoke of this also. And we've discussed this at length in a course called The Sacraments of the Gnostic Church. But I point this out because in order to understand this path of Tob, we have to recall that marriage is a sacrament. Marriage, or the union of man and woman, is instituted by the divine laws of nature. It's part of creation. Creation occurs because of the union of man and woman. Without that, there is no creation. Likewise, the soul cannot be created unless a man and a woman unite. And this is how Jesus explained it, that we must be born again. This is the second birth, which is the result of the path of Tob. And this is why Tob ends in Bet. Bet, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, is the letter that begins the Bible. Bershit, and God created. Right? It begins with Bet. This is the letter of the Divine Mother. She who has the Immaculate Conception. This can only occur in the union between a man and a woman. There is no other way. And this is why in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, it's written, marriage is honorable among all. Hmm? And the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. This statement very clearly illustrates these two paths of Da'at, these two potential outcomes of walking through the doorway of Da'at. Marriage is honorable if it is undefiled, but if it is defiled, it is defiled by fornication and adultery, by lust, by Ra, the iniquitous spirit that tempts the mind through the sex to indulge in eating the fruit. This is a very difficult thing for us to digest. But we need to recall that the very first miracle that Jesus performed to demonstrate his mastery was at a wedding. This is no accident. It is not happenstance. It's because the wedding is sacred. And in the wedding is found the heart and root of his teaching, which unfortunately was excised out of the Bible. And only shards of it remain. This teaching that he gave at the wedding was to transform water into wine. And what is the wine? It is the wine of the Eucharist. It is the blood of Christ. It is Shamayim. It's the fiery water that descends from above. When that water is transformed through transmutation, Christ can save. Christ saves through fire, but also through the fire in the water. What's very interesting about this is that path of Tob, which is what Jesus taught, the path of our Father, to follow our inner Father, to love our own God, with all of our heart and mind and strength, with all of our soul. This inner Father is our own inner Ruach Elohim. If you remember in the Bible, in the very beginning of the Bible, we have these days of Genesis, which symbolize the creation of the man, the creation of our own spiritual being, how we step through initiation to uh, fulfill our function. The one who hovers over the waters, the sexual waters, is the spirit of the Elohim, the Ruach Elohim. This is our own inner being. The spirit of the Elohim is Hesed, goodness, love, mercy. Our inner spirit, our own individual inner father. Every person has their own inner father. And that inner father is a particle or a spark of the great blaze, which we call God. Our own inner father is God. 
but it is individual in us, and every one of us has that. And the collection of them all is that great unknowable divinity. This is how we see that polytheism and monotheism are actually the same thing. But to get to the point, what's hidden here, when we analyze Tob and its relation with the Ruach Elohim, that spirit that hovers over the waters, if you add up the letters of its name, Ruach Elohim, the Hebrew letters, each letter has a numerical value. And when you add them up, the result is 300. And the number 300 in Hebrew letters is Shin. And the letter Shin means fire. This is a very deep symbol which we could give many lectures about just that. This is Shin. Shin looks like a trident, it has three points. It looks like a flame or a fire. It has three yods, or Hebrew letters yod, at the top. Those three points are the Trinity, Keter, Chokmah, and Binah, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the first, the second, and the third Logoi, which in their union are the solar logos, the cosmic Christ, the great blaze, the fire of life. That fire of life when it descends from those ineffable worlds above, first manifests as spirit, chesed, tob, goodness, our inner father, who is that spirit hovering over the waters, ready to create. So shin represents that fire of divinity. It's all these levels above related with Bria and Absolute. From those worlds, those supernal worlds of Kabbalah, emerges Dat, and from Dat emerges Shin, this character. Shin is deeply related with Bina, the third Sephira, which is the Holy Spirit. It's in that third Sephira which is a three in one, we can see its structure here. Three points in one shape. Bina is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit always appears as a fire, as a great blaze. Remember the column of fire that led the Israelites through the desert? Or the columns of fire that descended upon the apostles in the book of Acts? This is the Holy Spirit. This is the creative and destructive power of God which is fire. When that force manifests, it does so through Da'at, the upper Eden, which in Hebrew is called Shamayim. Shamayim is usually translated as heaven in the Bible. But literally, it's Shin, Mem, Yod, Mem, which if you break down the letters means fiery water doesn't get much more clear than that. The fiery water, the superior waters, this is the upper Eden, Da'at. And, that, and you remember in the Bible that God separates the waters from the waters, the superior from the inferior. This is Shin in the Shamayim, separated from the Mayim of Yasod, the lower Eden, which is sex. There's a deep relationship between these two. Throughout the Bible, we find scriptures telling us that God is fire. In Deuteronomy, it says directly, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. In the book of Matthew, John the Baptist says, He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat 
into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In Luke, it says, I am come to send fire on the earth. In Corinthians, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And it says further that we will be destroyed or saved by means of fire. That, the knowledge of good and evil, is the knowledge of fire. How to use the fire. And that fire is sexual. And any of us who've reached maturity know that fire because it boils the blood. When the sexual fire is boiling the blood, the tempter is there in our psyche, in our physiology, calling for that energy, tempting us. Temptation is fire. But remember this, light comes from fire. If we want the light of consciousness, we take it from fire. When we conquer temptation, we transform that fire into light. And this is what the teachings of the Gospels are all about. How to transform that fire into light. Knowing that this fire is the fire of God, which is the fire of creation, we have to look at the meaning. In Hebrew, fire is esh, which is spelled aleph, shin. This is how you say fire in Hebrew. Shin by itself can represent fire. But as a word, we put the aleph first. Why? Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph is a sacred letter, which also represents the upper spheres on the tree of life. It also represents the tree of knowledge. It also represents many other levels of meaning. As an element, it's one of the mother letters of all creation, and it represents air. Shin represents fire. But what's exceedingly curious and overlooked by centuries of theologians and scholars and debaters is this word esh in the Bible and how hidden and how beautiful it is when you see the meaning. Many hundreds of years ago, there was a rabbi who gave the clue. His name is Rabbi Akiba. He said this, If husband and wife are deserving, God's presence dwells in their midst. If they are not deserving, fire devours them. Interesting. For the Hebrew word for man is ish, aleph, yod, shin. If you remove the yod, this little dot, which symbolizes a man, you're left with fire, ish. The yod symbolizes the phallus, the masculine sexual organ. It also symbolizes a man or a person. Furthermore, he says, the Hebrew woman, the Hebrew word for woman is isha. Aleph, shin, he. The he in Hebrew letters symbolizes the womb, the uterus. So if you take the he out of the word for woman, the word fire remains. So the very basis of man and woman is fire. And what distinguishes them are the sexual organs, yod and he. These two letters, yod and he, are the first two letters of the divine name of God, jod he val he. Man, woman, 
phallus uterus, sex. What we see then is that within every man, there is fire. Within every woman, there is fire. If man and woman know the knowledge of Da'at and know the path of Tob, they can take advantage of that fire in order to walk the path, to be in harmony and to enter Eden. If they do not know this knowledge, that fire burns them. And we see this is true. The fire of sex is at the root of so much pain, so much suffering. And yet, we continue to believe that we can get away with what we want and ignore these fundamental truths. If these two fires are brought together in the path of Tob, in purity, those fires are united and transformed and become the basis for creation. They become the basis for Genesis within, Bershit. But if not, they are the fire of Ra, that impure spirit which destroys. What's interesting is that in the Kabbalistic tradition, they say that it's impossible to put this fire out. You cannot, because it is life. Life itself is this fire. It cannot be quenched. It is either needs to be maintained or it will destroy. Maybe not fast, maybe slow. But it is a fire. It requires great intelligence to manage it properly. And the Kabbalists state that if one leaves the fire as it is, it is impossible to manage because it generates evil. In other words, if someone tries to ignore the sexual fire, to avoid it, as in so-called celibacy, that fire destroys. And we've seen plenty of that in recent decades of so-called celibates who become child molesters and abuse other people sexually, who become tyrants. In fact, this misuse of sexual fire is the root of what we call the Spanish Inquisition. Because all of these so-called celibates were unable to utilize their sexual energy properly, and it rotted their minds and made them violent and fanatical. And that's why they committed so many horrible acts of violence. And we see this in other cases as well. That fire, if it is not managed, becomes the source of Ra, evil or the impure spirit whether it's indulged in or repressed, it becomes evil. The only way to use that sexual fire properly is through the path of Tob, which means to take a hold of that serpent and control it by will. Not an easy task. In the Bible, when Eve is tempted, throughout those first passages, the woman is never called Eve. I don't know if you've noticed that. She's only called the woman. And Adam is never called Adam. He's only called the man. They only get these names after they're cast out of Eden. Did you notice that? Previous to the expulsion from Eden, they are called Ish and Isha. And what's really interesting about that is that the word for woman, which we said is Isha, can actually be pronounced another way. Because you know, these letters, there's only 22. And you have to know how to pronounce it. There are multiple ways of pronouncing the same letters. If you say Isha, it means woman. If you say ishe, it means offering of fire. 
previous to Eve or the woman being tempted by the serpent, she's only called Ishe, offering of fire. She's not called Eve. She's called fire offering. Why is that? You remember I told you that the man and the woman have literal significance, but also psychological and physiological, right? It has, these symbols relate to our own body. And the woman relates to our sexual organs. And this is because our Malkut, our physical body, is feminine. That Sephiroth is feminine. Eve, this woman, rather, represents our own sexual organs, while the man represents the brain. Previous to eating the fruit, the woman is an offering of fire. The sexual organs are returning the sexual energy back to God. They are offering that fire to God. They are not abusing the tree of knowledge. Do you get that? It's clear, right? Ishe, Ishe means fire offering. The woman symbolizes transmutation. Harmony with the law. Not abusing the tree. The fruit of the tree. It's only after she eats that she's called Heve or Eve. And she's called that because she, it says in the Bible, she becomes the mother of the living. In other words, that fire that was previously going inwards and upwards to illuminate the soul and give life to that tree of life is now descending outwards to create physically outside, to create other bodies physically in a different way. And because of that, they were cast out of Eden. This is the basis of Tantra. The ancient basis of all religions, which in their heart are all religions of fire. This is why fire has always been a significant aspect of any ritual or offering. The fire represents the return of that sexual light. What occurs then, as I explained, the mayim, or the waters within our body, which are the sexual waters over which the Ruach Elohim floats, that mayim in our physical body receives shin, the fire of God, every day. It's that fire that stirs the blood sexually. When the man and woman unite and do not eat the fruit, that water and fire mix and form a very combustible element called shamayim, the superior waters, the fiery waters. If they eat the fruit, the water is cast out. The shin is dispersed. That fire polarizes negatively and becomes ra. If that water is not released, if those energies are retained and saved, they are returned inwards and upwards, up the spinal column, the vav. This is why the vav is the central character in the word tob. The vav relates to the spine. It symbolizes the spinal column. And it's through the vav that God creates. This is why in the Bible it says, and God created. Vav means and. After any ritual in the West, people always say amen to seal the ritual, right? In Christianity and, and other traditions. Amen has three letters. Aleph, Mem, and Nun. And the Aleph is here in the fire. The Amen symbolizes those three points of shin. It symbolizes this opportunity in the same way the shin does. And if you break it down, it's spelled Aleph, Mem, Nun, and is called in Hebrew El Melech Naman, which means God the Faithful King. What's interesting is, the reason that you're supposed to say Amen 
is to conquer Ra. You put the Amen as a seal over Ra, and what does it become? Amen Ra. The name of the solar logos in the Egyptian tradition. Right? Amen Ra. Where that Ra is transformed and purified, made clean. To go further, we look into this Amen. The Aleph is the air, the Mem is the water, which we've talked about. The spirit hovering over the waters is right there in the Amen. But the N, the Nun, symbolizes a fish. The fish of Jonah. The Leviathan. The fish which was the ancient symbol of Christianity. Right? But the Nun by itself, the Nun means life. The Nun is the seed. The nun is hidden in the seed, the sperm, the semen, the sexual energy. It is through the nun, the fish in the waters, the semen, that life emerges. And the nun is part of the amen. What we need to grasp there is that nun, which is also in the word Eden, it ends with the nun, is that force that descends and ascends. And actually the word nun means the superior light. So you see all these correspondences hidden in these letters and in these words. Very deep meanings, which take a lot of meditation to penetrate. The point that I'm getting to is this quote from the Zohar. So listen closely to this, because this really ties together the entire lecture. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, it says in Genesis. This river proceeding out of the secret place of the Most High never ceases to flow down upon the world or the garden as it's termed. This secret place of its origin or fount is symbolized by Bet, the first letter in the book of Genesis. It includes in itself all the other letters and symbolizes also the river which gives life to all things. The secret place resembles a narrow path, most difficult to discover and walk therein, yet be studded with many priceless gems. To me, that's pretty clear. The secret place is sex. And that river that emerges out of Eden, Eden means bliss. That river is that energy of sex. That energy is what creates all life. It gives life to all things. And that secret place resembles a narrow path most difficult to discover, which is, of course, the narrow path that Jesus pointed out. Enter in ye by the narrow gate. Difficult to find, he says. That narrow gate is Daleb. Dat. So the Zohar continues, from it, this river, or the secret place, proceed two great life forces, indicated by the word ha Shamayim, and used in scripture to denote the source of this mystical river. The words that follow after, ve haretz, which means and the earth, possess a mystical meaning, implying that the mystic river flowing down from the heavens onto the earth will bring with its waters peace and salvation to mankind, which will, in their realization, be the first fruits when heaven and earth become united and blended together. To fully comprehend that, you have to have studied the Bible a lot. Because that passage reveals the meaning of many other passages throughout the Bible, throughout all the scriptures about the river, about peace and salvation. But the synthesis of it is that from Eden flows this river which brings peace and salvation, if we know the path of Tob. If not, if those waters are cast out, if the fruit is abused, then those waters which flow from the Shamayim to Mayim in Yasod, 
flow outwards and downwards and form Ra, the impure spirit, which on the tree of life is called Klipop, hell. In other words, the river that emerges from Eden becomes the rivers that flow in hell. And we all are aware of Dante and his journeys in hell and the rivers he described and the rivers that are described in the Aeneid and in all the books of the different mythologies. Those rivers in hell are the same river that emerges from Eden. It is that fiery water that emerges from heaven, but when misused, becomes the fiery pit of hell. Ra. This is all hidden in the scripture. It doesn't mean that this is outside of us, and this is the key point. This is all psychological. This is what happens to us when we abuse sex. We can observe it in our own life. When we, in our own body, fall into the temptation of the serpent who tempts us through sex, and our own inner woman, the sexual organs, the isha, falls under that temptation to have sex outside of the law, as an adulterer or fornicator or whatever, that woman tempts the man, which is our brain. And when we fall into that temptation and we commit that act, that sexual act, that water that flows down from heaven that gives us life is flowing out of its proper receptacles in us psychologically. And that sexual fire burns us. And every one of us has experienced that if we've become sexually active. What does that burn feel like? It's not physical. It's psychological. What is the first sign that we should know of this? It's in the Bible. As soon as Adam and Eve, the woman and man, ate the fruit, what did they feel? Shame. They felt ashamed. They wanted to hide. And all of us who have committed this mistake have tried to hide it. But some of us hide it in funny ways. Many people just hide it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it. They want to forget that they made the mistake. This is a kind of avoidance. But the opposite polarity of that, on the other side of the pendulum, are those people who boast of it. They're trying to hide it by getting other people to accept them, to admire them, to envy them. But it's driven by guilt. It's a form of shame that's externalized as pride. This is a mistake that everyone is making because no one is educated in this knowledge of that. And because of that, suffering multiplies. To return to Eden, to go back into that bliss, we need to control those fires. And to make our woman, our sexual organs, a fire offering. To pronounce our own inner, um, what was it, isha? Ishe, which means fire offering. In other words, to take those forces and give them to God. To give them back to God. To let God take control of that part of our life. And this is another very interesting thing about our psychology. Many people are very spiritual, except when it comes to sex. Many people love Jesus or Krishna or Buddha, but don't want to think about Jesus or Buddha or Krishna when they're in the bedroom. Why? God made sex. Why should we be ashamed of it? We're ashamed of it because we know in our heart of hearts that we abuse it. That's why. So, when we learn how to respect the tree of knowledge, we learn how to retain those fires. In other words, we stop fornicating. This word fornication 
is also very interesting, very misunderstood. If you look in any um, book of etymology, which is the history of words, most of the modern ones will tell you that fornication comes from an old word from the 14th century, fornix, which means a vaulted archway. But that's not the root. It's not the whole root. It's a part of it. The actual root of that word is guer, which is an ancient Anglo-Saxon language. And it's the root of many words, primarily to heat, to warm, to burn. Fornication actually comes from the same word where we get the word furnace or oven. Right? And it makes sense when you know about Shin and you know about this teaching. Then you know why. That word comes from where it comes from. What happens is when a couple or an individual abuses the sexual waters, that fiery water, and that water is expelled through the orgasm, what remains? Fire that burns. Fire that harms. That's fornication, the furnace, the fire that burns. And how do we know this is so? Firstly, because in John, it says very clearly, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. What is the seed? The nun, the fish, the seed of life, the germ, the sperm, the semen, the sexual water. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Very clear. It says further in Leviticus, a man from whom there is a discharge of semen shall immerse his flesh in water and he shall remain unclean. There's more to it than that. But uncleanliness, impurity, ra, comes from that emission. It's explicit in the Bible. And yet, for centuries, we avoid that. People avoid these passages because they don't want to face the facts of what's written there. Jesus said, anyone who would seek to, to follow his path must first deny themselves. Right? And that denial is the denial of our own inner fornicators, our adulterers, our idolaters, our ego. Our own Ra. And when we do that, we begin to take control over those energies. By means of this, we begin to develop the capacity to walk in the fire without being burned. Do you remember in the book of Daniel? The three men, four men actually, who were in the furnace, cast into the furnace by the king, and they were not burned? This is a symbol of learning to transmute. In ancient times, the, the beginners, neophytes, who were being introduced into this knowledge, would go through a period of sexual, sexual abstention or chastity. In Sanskrit, it's called brahmacharya. And this is a period of preparation for marriage, within which the individual begins to train themselves to enter into that sacrament. This is where we got the basis of so-called celibacy. There are two main times. One is before marriage, and the other is after. Now, Paul, in the Bible, who recommends for a person to be alone had already completed the sacrament of matrimony. And this is why people misunderstand what he wrote. But Jesus states it quite clearly in the Bible, how to be a eunuch. Nonetheless, whether we are single or married, it's very clear in the Bible. It's written in Thessalonians. 
We beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vehicle in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord, the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us into uncleanness, but into holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. In other words, sex comes from God, but sex used in the right way for sanctification. So how does that work? We know that through eating the forbidden fruit, through the emission or ejaculation, those energies are cast out of the body. When they are retained, those fires are retained. And this is the basis of Taoism, Tantra, and Dat. These traditions that hold that force and transform it and utilize it. This is why in the book of Revelations, which I read to you last week, I'll reread this one line that says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. To buy gold tried in the fire is to utilize these fires of shin, insects to remove the impurities. This is what you do when you put gold in the fire. You melt it to take all the impurities out. And this is the ancient symbol of alchemy, the chemistry of God, which is to extract the impurities and make pure gold, the gold of spirit, the gold of the solar bodies, the Merkaba, the chariot of God. That thou mayest be rich in spirit, Rich in spirit is our own inner father. To have that within, not this emptiness and this pain that we have now. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. That white raiment is the soul, the wedding garment that's required in order to attend the feast of the Lamb. That the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Remember the shame of the nakedness of Adam and Eve that shame that we all live with every day, that through transmutation and the proper use of sexual energy is removed. And then there is no shame. Then we approach sex with honor, with sanctity, in remembrance of God, in order to return into Eden, bliss. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve. And this relates to the story we read last week where Jesus places the spit of his mouth mixed with soil on the eyes of the blind man to heal him. This healing is rated with ayin, the sight, how we see and know and experience. Through the transmutation of the sexual energy, our inner sight is restored. Our connection with God is returned. You remember in the Bible, when the man and the woman are cast out of Eden, they can no longer see God. When we return to Eden, we can see God again. In other words, the three of these represent the awakening of the consciousness. This is how we awaken the consciousness. This is how we develop the soul and become a true human being. That fire that tries the gold is in removing the impurities. And this is represented in the book of Genesis when God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah are two cities that were famous for their sexual crimes. Those are psychological cities that we have within. These are the spheres of Lilith and Nama. 
the two wives of Adam, the tempting feminine spirits that call us to fornicate and to commit adultery. Lot, who is faithful to God, is told to leave the city. Right? And the city is destroyed by fire. And listen, it says, And he, Lot, looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and towards all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace from fornication. So to summarize this, we'll read again this passage from Corinthians. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. you have any questions? Yeah, that passage relates. It has several levels of meaning. To be hot or cold actually refers to choosing a path, lunar or, or uh, straight or spiral. To be lukewarm is to be in the middle and not the side. To be lukewarm is to be the Arcanum 6, right, like us. To not be going anywhere. If one is cold, one chooses the easier path. If one is hot, one chooses the difficult path. It also relates to brahmacharya, the cold path and the hot path. There are two ways of transmuting sexual energy. To be lukewarm is to be doing neither. Was there another question? Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned that uh, the story of Adam Eve symbolized the fall of my humanity. Is there any correlation between that and Atlantis or any other time in the universe? Mm -hmm. The literal or historical um, story of the man and woman being cast out of Eden relates to the time of Lemuria, which was the civilization previous to Atlantis. And the fall of the Lemurians is symbolized there while the fall of the Atlanteans is related to the Great Flood. During the Lemurian age, the human beings of that time were tempted. And that's when this whole problem began to unravel. It's a long story. But yeah, it was a long time ago. Is there another question? There's a lot of knowledge hidden in these letters. It's very challenging to navigate them, as I'm sure you're experiencing right now. But if you are patient and you have uh, fidelity, meaning that you demonstrate through your actions to your own inner being that you are serious, and committed, and you make your effort, he will guide you. It's not necessary to memorize all of this. What's necessary is to do the work. And that work is daily and moment to moment. The fire that emerges within us is a sexual fire, but it's also a psychological fire. Because we manipulate those forces with our use of willpower. It's not important so much to um, decide to affirm to yourself that you are going to walk on that path. What matters is that from moment to moment you make the decisions to do it by controlling your energy, by using your energy wisely. We have within ourselves all the elements that we need in order to return to Eden whether we are single or in a couple. 
We talk a lot about the sexual cooperation between a man and a woman. And it's a very important aspect of Da'at. Yet, a person who does not have a partner can work and can achieve great things. Because these forces of man and woman, or Adam and Eve, are within us. So don't think if you're a single person that you can't start the work until you're married. It's not true. We do the work from moment to moment, no matter our circumstances, no matter our station in life, no matter our difficulties or limitations. If you have a physical body and you have a consciousness, you can work. That work is moment to moment. It's continual. It isn't only when someone has sex or doesn't have sex. It's in how we use our energy through our three brains. So Da'at, the doorway of knowledge, is within us, not outside. And we choose these between these paths of Tob and Ra through our actions, consciously, not by intention, not by wishing, but by what we do. And this is why the scripture says that we are measured by our works. That our works will be made manifest. Meaning our works will be brought into the daylight. If we're doing things that we are ashamed of, if we're doing things that we wish to hide, we should reconsider. Nothing is hidden to the light of God. Nothing. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Help Gnostic Radio to help others. Make a donation by visiting GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, we invite you to explore the wide variety of resources available on our websites. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.